those watching online, thank you as well. You know, we've missed 17 Sundays, 18 weeks since we were last together. And uh, it's amazing how much can change in 18 weeks. The virus, with all the racial tensions and everything going on. You know, during that time, three of our members have passed. Uh, we've had other funerals, we've had other things, and it's been really, really, really hard. Really hard. But I know this. I know all the members are in heaven. We did other funerals, and uh, hopefully they had faith in Christ and they're in heaven too. But I know this, that don't we really appreciate being together more than ever now? I mean... Think about how we take things for granted. And I'll say this, God allows things in our life to help us appreciate the familiar. Familiarity breeds contempt. And I'm excited that we're together today. So I hope that there's a fresh excitement to worship God. Thank you for those of you who are here, those who are at home watching online, whether you're part of our church or not, we hope you enjoy it. And when you're ready, uh, we are here creating a safe environment. We love you. Let me just pray. Heavenly Father, I'm excited. I'm trying to control my emotions, and I know other people are, too. It's so amazing to be with you and your people. There's nothing like it. That's why David said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. So be with us in this service. Help everything please you. Keep us safe. Keep this freaking virus away from everybody. And we ask this in the strong, virus-conquering name of Jesus Christ. And everybody who agreed with that will say... Amen. Thank you. I can't wait to say this. Good morning, Lakeshore! We're going to worship together. It's been a while. But we're going to sing this song that that has been speaking to us a lot, that God is the one who gives us peace. God is the one who grants us all of that peace. We're gonna sing that together. So you can stay where you are, you can stay seated. I wanna just encourage you guys, however you feel led to worship today is what you're gonna do because we know that he is the God who grants us peace and calms every storm. church.
How many of you believe that, that he is the one who grants us the peace, that no matter how raging storms go, he is the one who calms it. Let's sing this out. Let faith rise up, oh heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. Let faith rise up. chapter 4, right at the end of that verse, there's this beautiful passage, and we've shared this before. Jesus is on a boat crossing over on the water with all of his disciples, and a storm rages in. Storm rages in. Now, these guys are fishermen. They know the water. The water's coming over, and they say, teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Don't you care that we're going to die? Don't you care? Don't you see everything around us? And what does Jesus do? He says, why do you have such little faith? He stands up. He puts his hand out to the storm and says, peace, be still, and the storm calms. Now listen, this has been a crazy four months. Crazy four months. But God is still in control. God is still sovereign. And God is the one who will raise his hand and say, peace, be still. He has a plan and he has a purpose. Let our faith rise up through this. Let's have that new fire for Jesus Christ to go tell the world that we have the hope, that we have seen the hope, we have tasted the hope, and we get to share it with them. So church, let's sing this out. Come on. Let faith rise up, oh heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. Let faith rise up. Let faith rise up, oh heart. 
Amen. Church, let's give him a big shout of praise. Let's lift the roof off, roof off this place. Amen. Amen. Oh, it feels so good. My name is Dave. And I'm Lori. Oh, man, we are just so thrilled to be here spending time with you physically, in person. Not in our house. Not in our house. Yeah, we're not in our kitchen. The, the backdrop looks way better here. Yes. Oh, my gosh, this is just incredible. Whether you're watching us in the auditorium, if you're joining us in the gymnasium with your kids, if you're in room 110, we want to let you know that if you have any questions, if you need any assistance whatsoever, we have... Well, we've coined them the blue shirts. Is that what the we're calling shirts, them? The blue shirts, The blue shirts. Our volunteers are out in the atrium just ready to serve you and help you in any way that they can. If this is your first time joining us, if you're joining us online for the first time, if you're here physically for the first time, an extra special welcome to you. We would love an opportunity to connect with you. Yes, and the very best way to do that is through our Lakeshore app. So if you don't already have that downloaded, make sure you have that on your phone. You get the message notes for today's service. You can connect with us by hitting the connect button, and you can look at all of the different uh, events we've got coming up by hitting events. That's right, you guys. Listen, we are, well, I guess fittingly joining together for the first time physically, so why not start a brand new series? We're starting a series called Hacked. Did God really say that? You know those things that you hear all the time, the Bible quotes, and you wonder if that's actually scriptural or not? Right. I got one for you. God only helps those who really help themselves. We're going to find out today. Yes, we are. <laughs> In a moment, our senior pastor, Vince DiPaolo, is going to deliver a message today. We just hope builds your faith and encourages you. Well, again, everybody, thank you so much for being here. And those watching online, thank you so much as well for making the time. You know, a funny thing happened when the other pastors and I got together to plan this series. A little bit of kind of behind the curtains look. We plan series months in advance. So we get together, we start brainstorming ideas. When I do a series, I run it by other people and I do it. But during the summer, you get to hear from all the pastors and other times throughout the year. And then we plan the series out together. So we'll get together, bring together our ideas, we'll refine them, sharpen them, come up with a series title, a series descriptions, individual message titles, assignments, all of this. That's part of our process. So we don't just fall out of bed and say, I'm going to speak on this this morning. So we're together in Waves Cafe, uh, socially distanced, of course, with six feet more apart from us. And I start getting text messages on my phone. Hey, Vince, did you, did you just send an email asking me to uh, buy a gift card for you? And uh, right, so I get this, and, and all the staff get it. And uh, the pastors with me said they received it too. Now, to be clear, if you ever get an email like that, supposedly from me, don't believe it. I would never ask you for money by email. I typically do that in person instead. So, so as it turns out, my email had been hacked. Now, I don't know if it was technically hacked because they probably lifted all our email addresses uh, from the staff. Of course, mine is not on there. And uh, they pretended they were me. They, they tried to speak for me to get something that they wanted. And as we thought about this series, we were thinking about doing a series uh, that we are doing, which is about all these different things people say that aren't necessarily biblically true. And we said, what a perfect name for this series. Hacked. Hacked. Did you know that God gets hacked by others all the time? People claiming to speak on his behalf say some things that really did not come from God, even though they claim that, in fact, they did. Sometimes what they say came from God and didn't come from God can be really wrong and sometimes really, really, really harmful. In fact, eternally damning, as we're going to see today. So over the next eight weeks, we're going to look at some common and familiar things that people think God said. People think are in the Bible. People think are true, but they're not because God has been hacked 
He's been hacked. So for the next eight weeks, we're going to talk about that. You're going to hear from all the pastors. Now, our goal in this series, actually our three goals in this series are this. Number one, to point out error. You know, a good church points out error. You know, we live in a day in which increasingly um, people don't want to tell the truth, or when they do it, they tell it harshly. We live in a world of polar extremes. Either you're going to tell the truth harshly, bluntly, meanly, we talked about that last week, or you're not going to say anything. And the Bible says both, are, both of those are extremes that we must parry away and we must get to the center and what? Speak the truth in love. So we have to correct error. A church that doesn't correct error is going to go massively liberal and south. You don't want that. You want to correct error. Second goal of this series, to show you the truth. It's not enough. The Bible says uh, all Scripture is inspired by God for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness. So it's not enough for a church to say that's wrong. You also have to say what's right. And, and sometimes, and there are less and less of these churches, but, but as I was a younger Christian, we called them ain't it awful churches, right? Their whole thing was ain't it awful, ain't it awful, ain't it awful. How many ever been to an ain't it awful church? Like you never knew what was, none of you? Okay, good. Very good. I'm the only one. Scarred for life. The ain't it awful church will always tell you what's wrong, but then they don't tell you what's right. We're going to tell you what's wrong, then we're going to tell you what's right. And then finally, we want to provide application on how to live this out in such a way that uh, your life has changed. So open, I was going to say take out your Lakeshore notes. That'll be a little while. So uh, open up your app or tablet, and we're sending out the notes in advance. And I didn't send it in um, a PDF format, so I'll be sending them out each week and you'll be getting them each week in advance if you'd like them. But I want to start off with, I think, one of the most famous, one of the most common statements that God has been hacked with. Finish it with me when you know it. God helps those who help themselves. Did you know that one out of eight Americans not only believes that's true, one out of eight Americans believes that statement is a quotation of Scripture. One out of eight, 13% of people believe that. Can we help ourselves in any meaningful way? Let's answer that by looking at a parable which I think classically describes it. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's found in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. It perfectly answers this question by drawing a contrast, an unexpected contrast if you're new to the Bible, if you've read the Bible enough and you've listened to Jesus tell parables, it's an unexpected contrast in the results, but it's a very expected contrast because it's classic where Jesus contrasts a Pharisee who seems to have it all together and a tax collector who clearly does not. And he's going to draw this contrast to make this point and answer this question. Classic contrast by Jesus Christ in the parables. By the way, a parable is a short story with a singular point. You may be able to make other points from the parable, but the main goal of a parable is a singular point, and he's going to end with that, and we'll see that. And you need to be real careful when you interpret parables, because you can get parables that say crazy, untheologically sound things. So let's jump right in. I'm going to read through it, uh, except for the last part, and then we're going to uh, make some um, observations. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, get that? Jesus told this parabole, short story with a singular point. It, parable literally means to cast alongside, para alongside, bole, to cast, to cast alongside. In other words, he casts alongside a story to communicate a truth. It's alongside, the story is alongside the truth. Two men went up to the temple to pray, which was customary at different times throughout the day. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. See the contrast? The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I mean, I have to do his voice, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. That was a pretty good Pharisee voice, huh? I mean, without 18 weeks of practice, I mean, that's not bad. But, here's the contrast, the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, 
have mercy on me. He, he didn't even look up, sorry. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Sinner. And look at the startling result. By the way, the tax collector virtually contrasts the Pharisee in every detail, virtually. I tell you that the, this man, i.e. the tax collector, rather than the other, i.e. the Pharisee, went home justified before God. The guy who lived less righteous was the only one who was justified. How did the openly sinful tax collector become justified before God and not the openly religious Pharisee? And here's the answer. Because the Pharisee tried the God helps those who help themselves philosophy of life. And it didn't work. It never does. And that's always a problem. How so? Well, I want to come back through the parable, and I want to look at three problems with what I'm just going to call the help yourself view or help yourselfism. Okay? So let's go back through the parable. Let me draw three problems with it. Number one, the first problem is what I call performance. We believe in self righteousness. The Pharisee believed that he was righteous all on his own. He was confident in everything that he did, and he had quite a list. And there's nothing in the parable to suggest he lied. Nothing suggests he lied. He thanked God for his righteousness and moral superiority. Now, his focus was wrong, but he did thank God. He was confident he was not a sinner. That's what he thought of himself. He fasted two times a week. In the Pharisaic tradition, most commonly it was Monday and Thursday. And you need to know, other than for festivals and rare occasions, nowhere in the Bible was it commanded that you fast twice a week. These guys went over and above and fasted. And he gave 10% of all he got, right? Not just 10% of his income, right? 10% of his birthday gift money, 10% of his little uh, uh, stimulus check or whatever. He, did, he gave it all, but he was not justified in the end. Why not? Because no one is self-righteous. No one is perfect. No one is holy. No one can perform their way to righteousness. How good is good enough if you want the self-righteous performance plan? Answer, sinless, perfect, that's it. That's his first problem. He believed that he was self-righteous, performance. The second problem I see the Pharisee had in this approach of self-helpism and why if you rely on self-helpism it's not going to work for you either is it's what I call people comps. All right, comps is short for comparison. You know, we, we would talk like this in engineering and talk like this and we'd say comps. You know, let's do some comps. That means comparisons. We make comparison our standard. We make comparing ourselves against the hoi polloi, the masses, the standard of righteousness. The Pharisee uh, clearly had other people as his standard of righteousness. Notice how he stood by himself. He said, I'm not like others who are sinners, robbers, adulterers, evildoers, or even this tax collector. But he didn't acknowledge that we don't make comp people comparisons our standard for how righteous we are. I mean, what's the standard? Better than 50%? Better than 60%? Better than 70%? The best, even the best, is not good enough because our standard is not other people. Our standard of comparison is God and his perfection. And he's self-deceived, too. I am not a ro robber. I am not a robber. Well, he stood alone from the tax collector. He robbed that tax collector of dignity. Oh, maybe he didn't steal pens from work, or money from the account, but he stole. He was a robber. Then he said, I'm not an evildoer. James 2.10 says, if you break the law in even one point, you're guilty of the entirety of the law, everything. Not an evildoer? Yes, he was. 
I'm not an adulterer. Jesus said, if you look on a member of the opposite, he said a woman, but clearly in a patriarchal system, it applies vice versa. You look at a member, well, in today's days, you look at a member of the same sex or opposite sex with lustful attraction. Jesus says you've committed heart adultery, adultery right here in your heart. So he was lying, lying, lying again and again and again. The Pharisee had the wrong standard, people. And so he lowered his standard to make himself righteous. And that's what people do. People who believe in self-helpism, they know they can't be good enough, so they say there's got to be another way. And there is another way, but they choose the wrong another way. And another way is this. Well, it can't be perfect, so what, what it's got to be is I've got to be better than other people. How many know whenever you make other people your standard, you always feel like you're better than them? How many know that's true? Three people know that's true. You guys are sinners. You're bad. You need to get... No. We always do this. It's human nature. I'm not so bad. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler or anything. I'm a good person. It's because we use the wrong standard. Others. God is the standard. We have to compare ourselves to God for a true measure. Why don't we do that? That's the third problem with self-helpism. It's this, pride. We try to downplay our real shortcomings. In this, this list of good things that the Pharisee points out about himself, he never mentions one thing. It should be part of many of our prayers, a majority of our prayers. You know what he didn't mention? His sin. Not one word about his sin. Not one word about, hey, God, you know, earlier today I did this, uh, 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 yesterday I did that. You know, he never one time said anything negative about himself. Never one time turned to God and said, God, I sin. I need forgiveness. And we all do this too, don't we? We think our sins aren't too bad, and we think everybody else's sins are horrific. I may have mentioned this last week. I mentioned it a lot. I just love this quote. When I heard it, it was convicting, and it convicts me to this day. It was the great Protestant reformer, John Calvin, who said, if we confess 10% of our sins to God and others, we should consider ourselves very fortunate. We commit so many sins that we don't even realize. That's why God has friends to say, hey, Vince, you know, back there when you did that, oh, Vince, you know, back. But the tax collector was the total opposite of the Pharisee. He rejected every single claim of self-righteousness and performance, rejected any people comparisons. He fully came clean with his shortcomings. And God justifies him, not the Pharisee. What? That's crazy. Crazy. So who does God really help? Because clearly he didn't help the self-help guy, the Pharisee. He helped the other guy who didn't even try to help himself, the tax collector. What's the lesson Jesus is teaching here? It's the second half of Luke 18, 14, where he gives the summarizing principle, which is common for Jesus when he tells one of his approximately 40 parables in the New Testament. He says this, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is what Jesus, um, what, I, what I call a reciprocal parable. He, he teaches the last shall be first, but the first shall be last. If you want to be exalted, you'll be humbled. If you want to be humbled, you'll be exalted. Um, you want to be great, be a servant. He, it's called a reciprocal parable where he says, whatever you want, be the opposite. It's a principle. And look at what he says. For those who exalt themselves, who is that in the parable? Pharisee, clearly. Will be humbled. What does that mean? He's going to exalt himself, so God is going to humble him. How? By showing him he doesn't measure up, and he's not going to perform. He's not going to be good enough. Self-helpism doesn't work. But whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Notice the first part is what you do. The tax collector humbled himself, and what happened? God exalted him. The Pharisee exalted himself, and what happened? God humbled him. You do something, and God responds based on what you do. 
And by the way, being humble is not thinking lower of yourself than you should. Being humble is not even thinking higher of yourself than you should. Being humble is thinking less and less of yourself every single day. You don't think of yourself at all, or you try not to. So if God doesn't help those who help themselves, like the saying goes, like the Pharisee tried, who does God help? Here's the answer. The only people God helps are the helpless. The helpless. You know why? Because that's the only kind of people that exist. The helpless. We're all morally and spiritually helpless. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. We're all morally incapable of living consistently and even moderately righteous lives. If we could help ourselves, we wouldn't need God. I don't need you, God. I'm helping myself. And God wouldn't have needed to send Jesus Christ. It would have been a total waste. But it wasn't. Because we're helpless. God sent Jesus Christ. So where did this hack saying come from? A little bit of a history lesson here. Originally, most people believe it came from ancient Greece, likely through a story told by Aesop in one of his fables. You ever hear of that, Aesop's fables? It likely came from Aesop's fables. It's also taught in the Quran. I know I'm going to butcher this name. I've never read the Quran. Don't plan to. Also taught in the Quran in Arad, A-R hyphen R-A hyphen uh, apostrophe D, 1311. Don't go looking it up. It's just taught there. But it was popularized by a certain famous American. Anybody know? Benjamin Franklin in his Poor Richard's Almanac of 1757, quoting Poor Richard himself. Not Little Richard. Didn't he just pass away? Yeah, I'm really sad. Quoting, and his father was a pastor. Quoting Poor Richard, not Little Richard, in 1733. Franklin said, God helps those who help themselves. Benjamin Franklin was not a Christian. Benjamin Franklin was a deist. There was a certain segment of people in the founding of our country who were deists. They believed in God, but they believed in an impersonal God who was not involved in the world. Now, I bought one for my mother-in-law who's here today um, at that expensive clock shop, Walmart. But, but back in the day, if you didn't have electricity and you were in a situation, right, and you needed to wake up, you'd have what? Wind-up alarm clock. How many know what I'm talking about? Ooh, we're old. No, I'm just kidding. Not, not too many of you, actually. More than raise your hand for being sinners, though. I mean, that's just, I'm just, just being clear here. So a wind-up clock is simple. You get it at the store, you wind it up, and then what? You just let it go, and it does its thing. Deists believe God operates the same way. He wound up the earth, he got it going, and then he just his hands off, laissez-faire. People are going to do what they do. By the way, that's how you explain evil, a good God, the evil world. He's a deist, which... But the problem with deism is God is an extremely personal God. So personal, he sent himself, 100% God, 100% man, Jesus Christ, to the earth. But the point being is that Benjamin Franklin was biblically ignorant and was not a Christian, at least when he said that. That's why God helps those who help themselves is both uh, popular and yet unbiblical at the same time. Now, if he was a Christian, he would have believed the clear teaching of Scripture, which is in direct opposition to this God helps those who help themselves idea. It's found in verses like, this is the most blatantly obvious one, Romans 5, 6. Look at what it says. Paul says this, when we were what? Utterly helpless. Not just helpless, utterly helpless. Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners died for on our behalf us sinners which is a hundred percent of people universal in its nature only in acknowledgement of our virtual utter helplessness helplessness morally and spiritually in this condition like the tax collector in the parable can we find any justification from god and it only comes from jesus christ's death for us on good friday almost 2,000 years ago. You know that? In other, depending if it's A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, 
and another 10 or 13 years, it'll be 2,000 years when Christ died for us. It's an amazing thought. So how can you, God help you in your helplessness? Since God doesn't help those who help themselves, he helps the helpless because that's the only kind of people there is. How can you find help in your helplessness? Let me end by giving you two practical things to do. Here's the first. Reject in full your own self-righteousness. Reject in full any claim of your own self-righteousness. Stop trying to earn heaven. You're helpless to do so. Stop trying to perform. You're never going to be good enough. Stop trying to people comp. It's a lie. It's the wrong standard. Stop trying to be prideful. No one believes it when you say it. I promise you. Be like the tax collector and stop believing in your own moral goodness. Notice Romans 3, 10 to 12. Powerful verse. Powerful verse. It's about as blunt as you can get. I didn't even, I, believe me, I spared you. <laughs> if you read a few more verses after this, you'd be like, I hate myself. Look at what it says. As it is written, and Paul seems to be quoting from Psalm 14, 1 to 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Let's stop right there. No one who seeks God. Didn't Lakeshore used to be called a seeker-oriented church? Now we're attractional. I don't care what you call it. I want our doors open for anybody, no matter what they believe. How can you say you're a seeker church? The Bible says no one seeks after God. Right. Jeremiah, though, says, if you seek me, you'll find me if you seek me with all your heart. What's the rub? In and of your own ability, you have no moral ability to seek God. None. In that sense, there's no such thing as a true seeker. But when God does a work of provenient grace to draw you, when he does a pre-conversion work to draw you, he can give you a heart that seeks after him. It depends on your perspective. In and of yourself, you're not a seeking person. But by God's provenient grace, before you become a Christian, he helps you want to seek him. So that's the tension. He goes on. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Does that answer the question, are people born basically good or basically sinful? I mean, does that answer the question once and for all? Of course it does. We're all born basically evil. Eight times, Paul said, eight times, and I didn't read on. He either says no one, not even one, all or together, to reference our total depravity and our state of sin. If you believe that you're a good person on your own, I have to tell you something, and I want to be respectful. But if you believe that you're a good person or righteous on your own, you're lying to yourself, you're lying to God, you're self-deceived. The positive side, though, is this. The true option is this. Come clean. Come clean. Reject your self-righteousness. See yourself as a sinner who needs mercy the tax collector. This is the number one obstacle to becoming a true Christian, self-righteousness. And this has happened many, many times, but I'm, I'm thinking of one particular instance. I, um, there was a lady who attended our church. I don't know why it is. More women come to church than men. Um, whenever there's a married couple, it's more likely that if only one of them came, it's the woman, not the man. I, I don't know why that is. I, I, the only thing I can say is, from my own observation, there's slightly more women than men, but I don't think that is it. I think women are just more spiritually open to God. I don't, I don't think it's massively more, but it is. So the wife said, will you talk to my husband? I knew him. He's, uh, I don't want to say his name. Uh, some of you know him. And so I went, and, and I said, friend, so, uh, hey, how do you become a Christian? How do you become a Christian? Tell me. If you were to stand before God, and God says, why should I let you into heaven? tell me. And he goes, well, you know, like I'm a good person. Um, I don't do anything wrong. I don't hurt anybody. Um, I obey the Ten Commandments. And he went on and listed all his things. And so I looked at him and I said, remember, you only get one chance. Is that all you're going to say to God? He looks at me quizzically and he picks up, I'm looking for something more. So guess what he does? He keeps going on about how good he is. 
oh, I bought Girl Scout cookies. I don't know if that's what he said, but it's something like that. You know, I, 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 you know, I gave $10 to the Kiwanis Club. I mean, I, and, and all these, and, he, and, and I go, can you go, is that it? Is that it? Is that everything? And finally, he, he couldn't think of any more. He goes, yeah, yeah, that's it. And this is so common, so common. And I said, friend, you think that's good enough? And I said what I say a lot. I go, let's think about it this way. Is God perfect? Yes, he is. Good. Is heaven perfect? Yes, it is. Good. Okay. So why would a perfect God in a perfect heaven, let in anybody who is less than perfect. And then I said, you know, friend, you know one thing you never said one time about getting into heaven? You never mentioned Jesus Christ. <laughs> as sure as I'm standing there, he said something to the effect of, oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, yep, Jesus, yep. Oh, forgot. Forgot? Wow. It was amazing. Can I just be blunt? I hate to say this, but it's true. It's very true. Self-helpism is going to send more people to hell forever than anything else. More than anything else. I'm a good person. So here's the first thing I tell you. Reject it. Refuse it have nothing to do with it. Stop standing on your own righteousness and replace it with the second thing. Receive by faith God's imputed righteousness. That's a big word. Hang with me. God's imputed righteousness. I'll explain it in a minute. This is exactly what the tax collector did. He threw himself on the mercy of God. He put his faith in him. And today, it's faith in Jesus Christ. Now remember, Jesus Christ hadn't died, so he hadn't made full provision and payment for sin. So he threw himself on the mercy of God. By the way, how did somebody become a Christian in the Old Testament? Faith in God. How do you become a Christian in the New Testament? Faith in God, i.e. Jesus Christ. You, it was all, it, what people think in the Old Testament you became a Christian by do-goodism, self-helpism. No, you didn't. As we're going to see in a minute, we're going to quote Genesis 15 that says it's always been by faith. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible. But it was faith in God, and then God fully reveals himself in the New Testament, Hebrews 1, in these last days he's revealed himself in his son. And Jesus Christ comes along, and he is God, of course, and now it's faith in Jesus Christ. It can't just be in this nebulous God. It's got to be in the fullest revelation of God, the person of Jesus Christ, the God-man. And look at what he says in uh, Romans 4, 2 to 5. He says this, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, health yourselfism, Phariseeism, he had something to boast about, but not before God. In other words, he could boast if he was righteous, but he could only boast amongst his friends. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. But he couldn't boast before God because that's not the standard. What does the Scripture say? And here he quotes, you can see it in your notes, Genesis 15, 6 and Genesis 15, 22. Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness it was credited to him as righteousness this is a greek accounting term elogiste for those who like to hear greek words every now and then it makes you sound smart when you say that's why i don't say it a lot of times because i don't want to confirm that i'm not smart but elogiste it's the doctrine of imputed righteousness or credited righteousness you know when i go shopping sometimes i buy stuff i don't think i'm going to keep like but i'm like I might want it, and it might not be here, so I buy it, and then I go, no, nah, I don't like it. And then I bring it back, and what happens? I bring this, the shirt or the clothes. I, I, got, I got clothes problems. My wife says I got to clear out the closet. I don't, I, she, she, she thinks I, have, I, I do have more clothes than her. Anyway, so, so you return the shirt, and you go, I, I just want to return. And you know what happens? You give them the shirt and the receipt, you put your card in it, and they... Elogiste you. They credit you. They impute money back into your account. And that's what Jesus Christ does. When you believe God, Jesus Christ is God, 
you get credited, you get imputed righteousness. What do you do? Well, in the store, you return the shirt with the receipt, and then you get the credit back. With God, you go to him and say, I believe in Jesus Christ. That's the shirt and the receipt. And what do you get back? The credit is what? You are declared righteous. You are credited as righteous. You are um, given, assigned righteousness. Not because you are, but because you're forgiven. It's imputed on you. And then he goes on to explain, now to the one who works, in other words, tries to earn heaven, wages are not credited as a gift, but an obligation. So God's obligated to put you in heaven, huh? However, to the one who does not work, because we're helpless to work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, same phrase used for the tax collector, their faith is elogisthed, credited, imputed as righteousness. What we couldn't do, because we can't help ourselves, God did to help us in our helplessness. And it was provided by God in the Old Testament and now through Jesus Christ alone. Classic verse, Titus 3, 4, and 5 says this, to clarify this. And this is, you can find it in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, John 1, 12, so many verses, but this is a classic. When, but when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Saved, it literally means to rescue from a state of sin. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done. Not because of self-helpism, but because of what? His mercy. You know, what do you do to get mercy? Nothing. Except trust and ask for it. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Why? So that now you can live righteousness, not to get to heaven and say, please let me in, but to say thank you, because by his grace, he elogisthed, he credited, he imputed your righteousness through faith. Does that make sense? We aren't good enough, we can't be good enough, but Christ can show us mercy anyways. And Christianity is the only religion that says you go to heaven not by, what you, not by a single thing you did, but by what God did for you. Every other religion is do and do and do and try and be better. And Christianity says, give up the ghost on that plan. I just want to say this. We've been apart a long time. I'm kind of frustrated because we had a nice plan going into Easter. And you know what I say, you know, about plans, right? God, two things about plans. God always honor people who have a plan. Number two, God will never use your plan. He didn't use my plan. But I'll say this, and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not even barely moving, guys, so I got a mic problem. But I want to say this. Right before the, the virus, we did a series called People Matter. And for some of you, this message was so familiar. You knew it. You knew what I was, uh, okay, sorry. I'll pretend my neck's in traction. I think I know where it's come from. So, you knew what this was all about. You know why I said this? To deepen your well and to remind you that people need to hear this message. Our world's a mess. And I believe in peaceful protest, and I believe that there's racism, and I believe there's problems on all sides. I believe police officers sometimes get the run of the deal. Listen, I, no matter what I say, somebody's going to say something. You don't care enough about race. You don't care enough about police. I, I, look, at, say what you want. I love them all. I love everybody. So if you want to say what you're going to say, say what you're going to say. I'm, I'm ready for you. Come at me, bro. <laughs> but I'm going to say this. Thank you. I'm going to say this. People... With the, go with this, I'm sorry, I apologize. People still matter. And if they matter to you, we need to share this good news. For some of you, you've never thought of it quite this way. And I'm humbly going to ask you, what path are you going to choose in your life? Are you going to go Pharisee the rest of your life? Or are you going to go tax collector? God does not help those who help themselves. He helps the helpless, because that's what we are. Do you need help? 
God's arms are open and ready to provide for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this parable. Thank you so much that you help the helpless, of which we all are. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who forgives us when we put our faith in him. And for those who have never done that, whether online or in this auditorium, I want to ask you right now, don't just fall back on the, I've always been a Christian. Don't just fall back on the, I think so. Be sure. You already know the answer to the exam. God gave you the answer to the final exam. Stop trying to say I'm a good person. Stop trying to say I can earn it. You can't. The Pharisee couldn't do it. You certainly can't. Instead, say, Jesus Christ, I can't do it. Be like the tax collector. Have mercy on me, Lord, a sinner. And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ's provision for your sin, he will elogiste, he will impute or credit you his very own righteousness. And then all the good stuff you do is to say thank you, not please. And for those who are already convinced, God, give us a heart to tell more and more people about this message of the gospel, the good news. This is good news. And help us to do it as a church in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. If you just prayed with Pastor Vince and you made that first time faith commitment, we as your church want to let you know how excited we are for that, for that decision, for that life-changing decision. You are now a Christian. You are now a child of God. And as your church, we couldn't be more excited for you. And we want to help you. We want to come alongside of you. We want to get some critical next steps into your hands. Uh, get some resources into your hands, but we can't do that if we don't know about it. So you have a very, very important next step right now. Hop into that Lakeshore app, click that connect button, and let us know that you're making a first-time faith commitment. You know, we also recognize maybe you heard something today that just you're unsure of. You're not sure. What does it mean to be a Christian? Who is this Jesus? And you want to have a conversation with us, we're happy to do that. Just click also that connect button and let us know that you'd like to learn more. And during these trying times, the best way for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus is to go out into our community and love on our community. And we have a great opportunity coming up on August 16th through the 23rd called Love Week. We've done it in the past, and it's going to look a little different this year, but we're still going to have it happen. And right now, we just need people to lead some projects. So if you guys are interested in learning more about that, just head out to the Next Steps table after service, and we are excited to get Love Week underway. That's right. We're going to have over 20 projects, an opportunity to lead, to be part of. It's really an incredible time to be out in the community serving and loving on those around us. Yes, and if you guys are ready to worship with your tithes and offerings, now's the time to do that. In the Lakeshore app, you can just hit give. You can also text the word give to 585-332-5558. And then we also have the kiosks out in the atrium for you to do your giving that way as well. Yeah, also, if you, have, uh, if you want to give physically now, too, as well, out in the atrium, there's boxes, collection boxes you can uh, give there as well. So once again, thank you for your generosity. Uh, just an incredible, generous church to be part of, and we're so thankful for it. So, you know, at this time, we're just going to invite you guys to stand one more time. We're going to close out in some more worship. And I just love, I love the words of the song. May his presence go before you, behind you beside you and all around you. Can we focus on the blessing of God's presence one more time? Make his 
face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you, everyone. It is so great to see you. Have a fantastic week. We love you.